Well, I, my name is Jenny Douglas. I am the hosting director for Rebel, which is um, a fantastic new-ish and ever-growing platform for women in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond to come together across the country and increasingly in cities around the world in both in real life events um, and virtual events to comfort each other, amuse each other, enlighten each other, um, educate, affirm. Um, and as part of that mission, uh, I am just so happy to be able to welcome Libby Delana uh, here to our Raging Gracefully interview series. <laughs> um, and I would also really, while I'm thinking about welcoming, like to just welcome everybody who has shown up in support of this conversation, uh, both Rebel, uh, devoted revelers and friends of revelers and friends of Libby. And we're just, even though we can't see you since this is a webinar, we know that you're here, we're happy to have you here. And uh, you will be able to, um, over the course of our conversation together, ask any questions that come up and put them in the chat. Uh, and I will take a look at them. I'm, I wanna do my best to really be focused on Libby. So I'm not gonna divide my attention totally at the beginning of our conversation, but you can be sure that I will uh, dip in to look at the chat and make sure that your questions are conveyed to Libby uh, before we finish. So with that in mind, let me just say that I have spent the past couple of days just sitting with this beautiful book. Um, Libby has written uh, something that I have come to think of. It's called Do Walk, Navigate Earth, Mind and Body, Step by Step. And I've come to think of this book, Libby, as part memoir, part instruction guide, and part prayer that you can hold in your hand. Oh, isn't that beautiful? I haven't heard that description yet. I may have to, hold, I'm going to hold that with me. I love that. Thank it, you. <laughs> it's, well, it's so, I mean, it, I, I say that because... I know that you have, you're a designer as well, correct? And the book is, is just so, <laughs> it's so beautiful to hold and to, to go through. There's, <clears throat> excuse me, beautiful photographs, space on the page, instructions, beautiful quotes from different walkers, uh, past and present, that really inspire. And in my case, anyway, in reading this, just help me in the very active reading to slow down and um, kind of calm my nervous system a little bit. Beautiful. So um, that was the experience I've had just in immersing myself in your part, you know, a uh, prayer that you could hold in your hand oh, uh, so over nice. the past day or so. And um, so my understanding, and you can share more about this uh, yourself, is that this um, book came out with, is an outgrowth of a daily walking practice that you began one morning and I believe 2011, is that right? Um, that really you did it and then you did it again and you did it again and you did it again. And for over nine years, you have been doing that daily practice to such an extent that um, you've now logged how many miles in it is it enough to circumnavigate the, the world, is that right? You're right. Um, and it had seems like it's become so much more than a daily walk. Uh, so, um, I just, I guess what I would love to, to ask you first, Libby, is what inspired you or what made you take us back to like that very first walk in 2011? Uh, Did you know at the time that what was going to unfold would be, would become the thing that it has been or what? Well, um, first off, thank you for that description of the book. I think you perfectly articulated um, the hope for what that book is. So that, just to back up one step, um, the reason it's called Do Walks, it is published by a company called the Do Book Company out of the UK. And they are in partnership with something called the Do Lectures. Um, I am a devoted, uh, committed person to the Do Lectures. They exist, they started in Cardigan, Wales. They came to the US for about 10 years. The US is no longer um, um, going on, but they still run over in the, in the UK. And um, uh, it happens, the way I describe the do lectures is something like this. It's a, a, a TED Talks meets Burning Man with a splash of where the wild things are. So people right. attend for a, a long weekend and the people who give a talk, not a presentation, not a speech, but a talk, 
are living and staying with everybody who's attending. So it's not as if somebody comes and stands on stage and disappears out the back door. And so it becomes this really, really powerful community of what they call doers, right? Um, I was supposed to give a talk on this walking practice in 2019, I'm sorry, 2020. We all know what happened. I'm due to give that talk in 2022, but many of the people who give a talk are then asked to write a book. So it came out of um, your very kind comments on the way it looks and the way it's laid out and the way it feels. Um, I wish I could say I could take some credit, but I don't. It's really a beautiful um, series of field guides, really, field guides for doers. And they have an entire series. Some is how to bake sourdough, how to tell a great story. It's a beautiful series, how to you know, start a beekeeping practice. So that's where it came from. And so the beautiful size, it is meant to be a little pocket guide, um, uh, really is thanks to the Do Book Company. Um, my practice, as you noted, started in 2011. Um, to be perfectly honest, life was grand. Life is grand, but life was grand then. It wasn't as if I was seeking um, some kind of solve or some kind of balm for something that was aching or hurting. Um, I guess I just woke up one morning. I, had, I am, spent my career in the advertising world. I spent 15 years at a big agency in Boston. I'm a designer, art director by trade left that agency, not because anything was wrong, but had kind of had the itch to be an entrepreneur, started our own agency. So in 2011, we had been running our own agency for a number of years. It was wonderful. I have amazing partners. We had great clients. I had a healthy family. Um, but I woke up one morning and I guess what I really realized was a key piece of who I was. And I look back to when I was eight, nine, 10, 13, 14, and I realized the key piece that really makes me truly happy is being in the outdoors, moving in the outdoors, hiking, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And that really wasn't part of my day. And mm -hmm. um, my days were lovely, but it was a lot of errands. It was a lot of carpools. It was sitting in meetings. It was coming home, cooking dinner. And so I just decided that one morning, I thought, you know what, I need to make time to commit to myself and also to that thing, to get back to that thing that is exquisitely nourishing for me. It is grounding. It is a teacher. The outdoors is a teacher for me. Um, it is also, um, as I said, the place I'm happiest. In a way, I feel most loved. I mean, that sounds sort of funny, but I am myself in the outdoors. Um, that's not to say I'm not in business meetings, but I'm really there. Yeah. So I'm a believer that you don't find time for the things that matter, you make time. And so I just committed, I was going to get up half an hour earlier mm -hmm. and just go for a walk. Um, mm -hmm. I'd spent my high school years and college years as an athlete. So it took me, it took me a little while um, to get over my ego that kept saying, wait a minute, you're just walking? Why aren't you running? But mm -hmm. the but the real intention wasn't sort of a workout or necessarily exercise. Mm -hmm. It was to slow down and to be in the outdoors. And mm -hmm. so it was consciously not a run. It was mm -hmm. consciously not, a, you know, I don't know what, you know, whatever else I might be doing, cross country ski or snow, you know, snowshoeing or skating. Yeah. Um, it was a very intentional kind of thing. And so I committed to go for 30 days and I haven't stopped. That's kind of like Forrest Gump. I, here we are 10 years later. Yeah. And it was about two years ago. I just quickly did the math and realized I had walked about 25,000 miles, which is the circumference of the earth. Um, but having said that, I, um, what's really important to me in this practice is the number of steps don't matter. The mileage does not matter. The number of minutes I spend outside does not matter. But I know roughly what I walk every day. I, um, so that's how I made my calculation. But again, it is not about tracking my steps. Um, and that's not to say there's anything right or wrong about that. That's a wonderful practice too. But um, I, for me, this was about being outdoors. And in, as you noted beautifully, it's... Um, a little bit about slowing down. And I have a, a really dear friend, Cheryl Strayed, who wrote a book, Wild. Um, and um, in fact, um, 
we've um, done some events together and talked about walking. And one of the things she talks about is seeing the world at foot speed. Mm -hmm. If we think about that, as we pass through the world at a walking pace, we see things very differently than if we drive through. Or, and so, that. yeah, and so but that I, notion. Yeah. yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, please. So that no, the notion of seeing the world at, a, at foot speed means we see, we hear, we smell, our senses are more invigorated. Um, and I always say my morning walk really taught me how to see, not just look. And as well, an art director, it, yeah. that's a critical thing. Well, I think that idea of foot speed is so beautiful, especially given the times that we live in now where so much is coming at us all the time. Images, texting, social media, concentration or lack thereof. And the pacing of everything has never been faster. And I, I worry sometimes that we're losing a lot uh, in the service of haste and speed and efficiency. So the idea of foot speed to me is such a beautiful idea. And interesting that, or not surprising that you should mention Cheryl Stray, because the very first thing that I wanted to do is just, you know, many people, she's your friend, which is fantastic. And she's also known to many of us a lot of us, a lot of the world as the author of Wild, which is about her own experience of the transformation of her experience. Where was she walking? Where was that? Pacific Coast Trail. Yeah, exactly. Um, and of course, it was made into a movie with Reese Witherspoon. But she says here, this is the way she describes your book, an illuminating book that powerfully conveys a simple truth, that putting one foot in front of the hour is a transformative act. Delana writes with insight, heart, and wit about love, loss, work, creativity, and the mysteries of being human. Do Walk is a moving and wise book about one woman's long path towards enlightenment that also tells the story about all of us. So I was intrigued by, I mean, the whole thing is beautiful, but the idea of two things jumped out at me, a long path to enlightenment and also the idea that your story and telling your story, you're also somehow telling, shedding light on a story that we all share or all can have access to. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about that. Or if you have anything to say, or if you're feeling anything about the idea of your own long path to enlightenment, and then also well, to three to which is a larger story. Yeah, well, thank you. It's a great question. I think, um... I think I, I, you know, I, I happen to think that path to enlightenment is eternal. So the long path continues, right? Um, I will say that over the course of 10 years of walking, um, I learn something new every single day, all the time. It is a teacher. It is the place where I learn the most about myself, the most about the world. So, um, you know, that, that notion of trying to get to enlightenment is uh, step by step and walk by walk and, you know, cold morning after cold morning. Um, mm -hmm. you know, one, of, one of the things I have often said is, you know, people say, well, do you go every single morning? I say, yeah, I go every single morning. And if I'm sick, it might be a walk around the block. That's fine. But I get out and I breathe the fresh air and I go around the block. Um, you know, recently we had a lot of snow here, here and it is um, pretty icy today, actually. <laughs> um, but, um, and there are plenty of mornings where, um, you know, I wake up and that little voice, you know, that little voice, she's very sexy. She's very convincing. <laughs> the one that she says got, stay in bed. But, you know, <laughs> and the one who says stay in bed, you've done it for 10 years. Just Correct. chill out. You're good. Yeah. We're good. Like, yeah. Um, and it is, in fact, on those mornings, I believe that there's the most to learn. That's the day you have to go. I love or, that. That's the day I have to go. There's no shoulds for anybody else. That's the day I have to go. It is, um, you know, after um, I wake up and that little voice says, mm, don't go. Um, I, I'm, I, it's a clue. To, it's time to go. <laughs> I love that. Well, you know, I couldn't help but being re be reminded a little bit as I was reading your book about, well, first the idea of like your walking as a practice and not, as you said, like it's not about power walking. It's not about losing weight. It's not about being goal oriented. I was thinking, I don't know if you ever read the book, Zen and the Art of Archery, Eugene Harrigal is talking about purposeful purposelessness, yes. which I love the idea of, you know, the archery, just don't try to get the bullseye, just keep going just and keep have trying. it be a thing. 
And I feel like that's what you're doing. And I was reminded also while reading your book about my own 10 day silent meditation retreat that I did of a Vipassana retreat and how that was at once the hardest and best thing I've ever done in my life. The idea of sitting on a medit and honestly, Libby, like there, there was part of each day that I plotted my escape, <laughs> you know? So that was that, sure. that, that, the equivalent of like the sexy voice or if not the sexy voice, just the voice saying, get the hell out of here. You know where your car is. You purposely didn't give your keys, you know, to your car keys to the admissions people because you wanted to be able to hold out the option to escape. And you can do that, Jenny. And mm -hmm. just say, okay, you know what? Just see if you can stay for another hour. And I feel like I'm so glad that I did, Libby. I learned so much about myself oh, sure. just by sitting through the fire of my own desperately not wanting to do it anymore. Right. And so for you to be engaged in the practice, which is so admirable to me, and I also really can understand the value, I think, of just saying it doesn't matter what the weather is. It doesn't matter if you're sick. I love the idea that you'll just walk around the block if need be, and that you will tailor it to what you might be going through day to day, but you won't bail on this thing that has really um, given you gifts. Yeah, and not only, well, congratulations on 10 day silent retreat. That's it, that's, I haven't uh, gone back, but I might. <laughs> no, but I, um, that's impressive. Um, you know, sometimes I feel like my walk is a silent retreat because um, I, you know, there's I, somebody asked, do I do it with my, myself or with others? And the answer is yes to all of that. So uh, during the pandemic, friends and I would walk. It was a great way to get together, but most of the time I do walk alone. But um, what was I going to say? I think, you know, the thing about the notion of a practice is um, when it gets hard um, is, uh, as I said, is often where the lessons are. And it's also, um, it's such a beautiful commitment to yourself when you say, you know what, I'm going anyway. I'm going, you know, the story I'm telling myself in my head that it's too cold, that it's too icy, that it's too, well then, you know, shift your, your expectation of the day again, go around the block, but uh, don't give up on the practice. And I think interesting when you said, you know, you're plotting your escape, which I totally understand. There are times I, I head out on this one path. It's out on a place called Plum Island. It is absolutely glorious. I walk about four or five miles out and I turn around. Always when I turn around, there's a headwind. I never remember it. Every time I turn around, I'm like, Oh, for God's sake, <laughs> this is going to take me forever. It's going to be cold. I'm grumpy. I didn't bring enough. I bring raisinets with me in my pocket or raisins all the time. And I, you know, and that's when the step by step, that's when the, I'm going to see if I can stay one more hour. That's when the, if it's a seated that. practice, if it's a seated practice, it's right. just, I'm going to acknowledge how hard this is, but the only thing to do is to break it down into right. each step. The next hour, the, right? Don't get ahead. Next don't yeah. the next breath. The next Let me breath. ask a question that's coming to me. I'm thinking about you know this the the importance of this idea of practice as opposed to something goal oriented, yes. and I'm just wondering about like I was thinking about how ripe the idea of practice is, particularly to women our age, and how like the idea of practice is something I would have been less patient for and with when I was younger, when I felt like I couldn't afford to make mistakes because. You know, the perfectionism of being younger and feeling like you have to chart your course in just such a way. And if you derail, mm. it could be catastrophic. I mean, I truly felt that way when I was in my mm. early, you know, mid 20s working at a women's magazine in New York and and miserable, but feeling like I, I couldn't make a mistake or I would be forever off when I was older. And I feel like there's I don't know if you agree with this or not, but I feel like one of the many gifts about being older is feeling um, like there's more liberty to, I mean, we've all gone through stuff at this age, right? And we've fallen off the boat many, many times. We've gotten back up. So we've kind of come to understand if we're lucky that life itself is a practice. Yes. And yes. so this is just a further girding in the thing that um, we kind of have come to understand if we're lucky and open to that idea. No, I think that's, that's beautifully stated. And one could use... Certainly we're all familiar with the word practice. And if anybody you know, is, has a seated practice or a yoga practice, we, we know that word. I think there's also something in the word ritual. Mm, I think I there's some, something about um, this ritual. Somebody just noted commitment to the process, not the goal. That's right. That the mm -hmm. ritual of going 
every day and seeing the sunrise and you know I sort of gently mentioned that this practice has taught me how to see not look and that's because I do it every day and I often do the same walk there is one barn on my walk that I go past and I think she single-handedly literally taught me how to be a better art director because I would go past it the same day at foot speed Mm -hmm. And I would see her and she looked different every day. The color, the sunlight, the clouds, the rain, mm -hmm. my internal weather. Mm -hmm. And there would be days when I'd literally pause and just look at this structure, this barn. I remember one day really feeling like, you know, this barn has a significant place in this community. It has housed the dairy cows for mm -hmm. probably a century has mm. fed this community. And so all of a sudden I saw this barn, which is really kind of falling apart this at this point, which I feel is like an elegant elder woman sitting there. She's yes. gorgeous, and despite yes. the fact that weathered here and there. But, um, you know, she is a, as, a, um, as a ritual process to go and look at the same thing day after day after day and to we all know that it looks different every day. We all know that we see it differently, but to do it and to really, um, you know, hold that experience as important is- um, It's so true. It's so true. I'm reminded of two things. One, when I did that silent meditation retreat that I mentioned, there was a big oak tree in front of the center that I was at in Northern Massachusetts, close to the border of Vermont. And that tree took on so much importance for visiting it every day, for putting my hand on its bark, for feeling steadied by it in a way that outside of that time, ten, the, the container of that retreat, I might not have been as attuned to. Sure. And in a similar way, and then I want to, we do have a couple of questions that I want to get to. Um, I was thinking, and I want to ask you how COVID has impacted your practice. Like I do remember when um, COVID, when we were at the, when it was raging and we didn't have a vaccine in sight and we were afraid to do anything other than take furtive trips to the grocery store, I happened to have a little, you know, posted stamp backyard in my Brooklyn, behind my Brooklyn brownstone and um, something about the birds and the magnolia tree that I just hadn't noticed the color of. Like it just, it felt like everything was in technicolor just simply for me showing up every day and noticing it. Uh, I love that. And I think that's the, the transformative piece of going for a morning walk. And if we, you know, if we are able bodied and I don't take that um, truth for myself uh, with any, um, you know, uh, I, I am grateful that uh, I am, I am able bodied and each one of those walks is a, a, an experience. One of the things I always say is the more I move, the more I am moved. Yeah. So the more, that. The more we all get out and move about, I think um, the more we can be moved. And that was certainly true during the pandemic. Um, there was, a, I um, started my practice a lot with earbuds in, listening to music or books or podcasts. And it was really during the pandemic that I profoundly didn't want anything to, to listen mm -hmm. to. I just, uh, I just wanted the quiet. And I would, I feel as if the answers were in the quiet. So that talk about that transformative piece and talk about that practice and talk about it has to be a long practice because I wouldn't have gotten to that lesson uh, right. until, um, you know, until that experience. So now I really rarely listen to anything. I'm very, very fortunate to walk in a place where there's incredible wildlife. I've been seeing snowy owls all the time, which is amazing. Um, so. That's yeah. getting me too. like the specifics of your walking practice. We have um, Deb, who is watching and is asking of you, and I'd love to know more. I don't know if Deb is someone you know or is a reveler, but grateful to have your question. Yes. Do you want alone with others or a combination? We'd love to know a little about the specifics of your practice. Sure. Yeah. So, so the answer is all of that. Um, I would say um, eight out of 10 times I walk alone. And I, I love that. I love um, that time to problem solve, to care for myself. I don't happen to be terribly good. I think this comes from an athletic background. I don't, I'm not very connected to um, what my gut is telling me. Um, my head takes over, tells all these stories. It's very convincing. Um, 
And so for me, walking by myself really helps me connect to what the, what the deep stories are within my bones and within my body. So I love walking by myself. I never feel alone. Um, I'm often asked, you know, how do you keep yourself safe? And it's a really fair question. So number one, I've been doing this walk in the same community. I think everybody kind of knows who I am at this point. It's such a small community. Uh -huh. But in, in fairness, I, I always have my phone with me and um, I carry a whistle in my pocket. I've ne thankfully never had to use it. I also like to recommend to people, there's this really, this isn't an ad. It's just something that um, a number of my friends have carried. I now have one. Uh, it's called a birdie and it can go on a keychain. And it's one of those things that if you need to, you can pull it open and it flashes and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I know I'm terribly fortunate to walk in a place where, um, you know, a single woman out walking is, um, feels mostly safe most of the time. Um, I was fascinated I, to see, that, sorry to interrupt, I was just fascinated to, to, you, to, you see, to, to hear you say in your book that there have been occasions where you'll walk with a friend who in front, and you'll be separate. Your friend yes. will be in their apartment walking yes. around their apartment while you're doing your own walk, but you'll keep each other in each other's thoughts, I'm guessing. Yes, yes. Sometimes we'll actually be talking to each other and the, someone will be walking over here and I'll be walking over there. Sometimes, you know, a friend of mine who lived in New York during the pandemic, I'm like, okay, get your earbuds in. We're going to walk. You walk up and down the stairs. I'll walk here. I'll tell you what I'm seeing and let's just keep each other uh, company. Yeah, that's so, that's so great. Um, let's see if we have any other questions. Oh, we've got some beautiful, oh, here's somebody asking, do you walk at night? Speaking of safety, it's nice to look at the stars. It is, and this sounds ridiculous, but I always say a morning walk is actually um, a mindset. Mm -hmm. So if your morning walk doesn't happen before noon, you know, go whenever you can. For me, the notion of a morning walk is really about kicking off your day with a commitment to yourself. Yeah. and um, a commitment to something that potentially, you know, can set your, you know, your day up beautifully. Um, I have walked at night. Um, there was one particular walk, um, which I talk about in the book. I don't frequently talk about, but I got some very uh, hard, intimate, troubling news one day when I was at work, and I thought, okay, well, I can go home and either get in bed. Or, I mean, I just wanted to hide, and the great thing at that moment was I'd been walking for, I think, eight years, and I knew actually the thing I needed to do was walk. And so talk about a night walk. I walked all night. I didn't know I was going to do that. I, I, I read that, yeah. Um, I, you know, I got my shoes, got home, got my shoes on, I did a lap. And after every lap, I would pause and I would just check in. Are mm. you done? Do you need a cup of tea, hot shower, want to go to bed, whatever. And I wanted to walk. And um, I think, again, it's sort of, I shared this in the book, that adding motion to emotion for me helps me um, understand it. And quite honestly, that night walk was a grieving. It was a grief walk. And um, each loop I did, I really attended to a new phase in that grief process, anger, dismay, rage. And so I just, you know, each loop, I was like, okay, this is the angry, this is the angry loop. Let's go bring it, bring it all in. This is the weepy, you know, and um, so I got home at seven, took a shower and went off to work. But I would say at at that point, it's a great question about safety. Again, I, I feel safe. I'm six feet. So I think most people probably think I'm not a female. <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I live in a place where um, I do I do feel safe. And uh, the note, it's awfully nice to look at the stars. It sure is. Wow, that is, it is magical. I will say, I usually hit the road at about five in the morning. Most of the time, the stars, certainly now, the stars are out then. And recently, some of the moons. Woo, beautiful. Beautiful. The idea of a grief walk is so beautiful. And, you know, I think I really um, take to heart your observation about yourself that it can be so easy to naturally be cut off from the wisdom of the body and our own body's intuition. And I'm thinking about that beautiful book, The Body Keeps the Score, which oh, you made yeah. like such important work. Yes. Um, and so you're instinctively deciding when you got this phone call that really put you into grief, that what your body needed was yeah. to walk. Yes. And it would, heal, it would find healing through that action. Yes. Just feels like it's so, so wonderful that you had that kind of wisdom about what you needed. 
I don't know that I would have had it if I hadn't had an eight eight year walking practice. Right. To be perfectly exactly. honest, as I said, I grew up as an athlete, and the way to, I was a rower, and the way to be a successful rower was to ignore what your body was telling you. Right, right? like you just row through the pain, and so I was well trained in that. Now I have this visualization. You know, um, it doesn't matter if it's your own child, but do you know when you um, pick up a newborn and you and people instinctively just start rocking like this? Yeah. Right. You just you hold that little bundle and you just sway from one hip or one foot to the other. For me, that's my visualization. So if I have this knot in my belly that I can't or my chest or my back of my throat, the way I visualize it is my walk is like a massage. As I go out and I just start walking, that knot loosens, 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 and I can begin to see the threads. I can begin I to see that story. And again, it's by adding motion to emotion that I'm a, for me anyway, um, that I'm actually able to see my emotions. Otherwise, I'm, they're sort of like down here and I spend a lot of time up here. <laughs> I love this. This is also inspiring. Um, we would be remiss or I would be remiss if I didn't um, bring up your Instagram account oh. and following just because I, it feels like it's been a really like very current and, you know, um, galvanizing force in the surface of everything you're talking about it's called park here is that right on instagram which yeah, goes that's my middle park. name park. You exactly know. and you've got 30,000 followers and i follow you and it, it, it looks like you take some pictures on your walk sometimes is that right well so i you know i um I started because of the, practice, the business that I'm in advertising 10 years ago when I started my walking practice, Instagram was just coming onto the scene. And quite honestly, I'm about to turn 60. So and when I would, when I was 50 and walking into client meetings and clients would say to me, Liv, you've got to talk to me about social media. What am I supposed to do? I am the kind of person I have to use something to really understand it. So actually, when I started my walking practice, my um, accountability partner was my Instagram. I would take a picture because, again, that's my world, our direction. I'd take a picture, post it. It was for me. It still is. Honestly, I don't even know who's watching. By Honestly, it is for me to keep track of my days and to remember. It is a visual journal for me. Yeah. Um, you know, just recently I had a story done in Magnolia Journal, which is Chip and Joanna Gaines, and all of a sudden that number changed dramatically. But quite honestly, it is still per a very personal expression of what happens on my walks, what I'm learning, right. and yeah. Well, again, it speaks to that practice that you're doing for yourself. And you're sharing it if people are interested, but it's sort of a little bit back to that idea of purposeful purposelessness. Yes, that yes. You're, you know, you're you're posting because it feeds you. And yes. if it feeds up, it's fine, but it's kind of a different chord that is being sung than a lot of the chords in the world of social media that are often struck by people who are younger than us and no judgment on them, but different huh? sort of intentions. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Um, I see a lot, a lot of uh, questions. I know we probably have to go yeah. here about yeah. uh, safety. So, a lot of um, safety. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, it actually should be the priority for everybody, right? Let's yeah. let none of us go out and if we don't feel um, safe. Um, and uh, I'm sorry to Lori that she's being called. Well, no, not sorry. Being a grandma is amazing, but I hope you don't. I'm sorry you feel uh, assaulted about that. That's. That's no uh, joke. And I'm sorry you Definitely. feel that way. For yeah. sure. Um, I, I want to just mention one quote that I love by Thich Nhat Hanh, who, of mm. course, you know, as we know, recently passed many of us, walk as if you were kissing the earth with your feet. And, you know, you mentioned him. And as a matter of fact, during part of COVID, my boyfriend and I retreated to a little cabin that we have in the Catskills. And I would listen to Thich Nhat Hanh while I was doing my own walking, thinking about that very suggestion of his and how it really did, like, it changed the way I walked. Yes. Like it gave a kind of reverence to the act of my daily walks that really made a difference. So yeah, I'm grateful to him. I'm grateful to Hugh. I'm grateful to all the people that you invoke in this book. Uh, well, and aren't you nice? I think, you know, one of the other things he talks about is, um, I'm not going to get the quote quite right, but the intention is, as you place your foot on the ground, think about the energy you put into the earth. Mm. So, and that is a really beautiful, I, I think about that all the time. How am I putting my foot on the ground? What energy do I, am I holding that I'm transmitting to the earth? And so it's this really, um, really beautiful connected um, and, sequence. And 
Yeah, and it's just it, it. And I think you can. We can all take that. Uh, we can extend that and think Absolutely. not only are the is the energy that what is the energy we're putting into the earth, and then what is the energy we're putting out into the world each day. Without you know, it's such the same. a good question, um, <laughs> Libby. I want to close with this beautiful quote. It almost brought me to tears um, toward the end of your book. Not quote. It's a paragraph that really talks about your feeling of the ultimate utility of your morning walks. Ultimately, morning walk is about love. Love for the planet, love for the bend in the road, love for the ability to do it, love for bumping into friends along the way, love for the blistering humidity, love for the cold toes, love for the time together, love for the solitude, love for the warm drink after, love for the ability to move, love for the space to think and just be, morning walk is about love, period. I just thought that was so beautiful. So oh, uh, we're just, it's been such a gift to have you um, as part of this conversation to be talking with you about this beautiful thing that you've created, do walk, navigate earth, mind, body, and uh, mind and body step by step. I'm going to definitely, I'm so glad you mentioned that this is part of a series because that sounds like something that all revelers should be aware of. And uh, I also think clearly from our conversation and from having read the book myself that all revelers very specifically should be focusing in on this and the, on the, the gifts that it has to give each of us, especially at this age that we're in. Well, thank you, Jane. It's a great conversation, terrific questions. And thank totally you everybody great. for joining. I, um, you know, if you have, if you have any ongoing questions, feel free to reach out on Instagram, just DM me and um, always love hearing from people. So thank you so much. It was a great conversation. Thank you. So thank great you. to have you. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye everyone.